We're back in the flesh, everyone. We're back in the flesh on a Chesterfield sofa. Feels so nice, doesn't it? Feels lovely. Mark's here, John's here. Great. Callum Watkins is here as well. Yay, Where's Callum, he come guys. from? All right. Look, this Where's is he so come? good. He's come from Leeds. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Leeds. Yeah, come over from Leeds, yeah. Oh, mate, we appreciate that. Isn't no, no, it good it's... to be back in the flesh amongst people? You can touch people. We've all been tested. <laughs> well, Callum's <laughs> just been training, so, you know, the last... Probably six months. So he's been around people. Well, yeah. it's just it's just you who's mm. been locked in a flat I've, in London. I've, is it, is it just, it's just I've you. missed this. I've missed right. this. Okay. This contact. This closeness. Socially distanced. Yeah, of course. Socially distanced. How yeah. are you, Callum? You good? Yeah, really good. Thanks, mate. Yeah, yeah good. Uh, look, we always like to get stuck into people's stories, and I know you know these two clowns from a different. You were at Toronto, but for about half a second with John, weren't you? Yeah, I don't Did you, it doesn't <laughs> doesn't count. It doesn't count. Really, really. Did you get, really. get a training count. kit? Was it? You know, no, we, didn't, long no. we didn't even see each other as no. Toronto players. There was no just, we, just we webcam never Zoom calls. Company. Zoom calls, yeah. About wages and getting paid. Yeah, and when <laughs> when that will never happen. <laughs> <laughs> More importantly, when someone bid when. on your shirt though. You got a shirt number. Yeah, I did actually. <laughs> just the one. Yeah. Uh, what, num- what number? Were you at? That's the only story. That if yeah, no, we could yeah. come up with. Really. Well, I know. Toronto. I don't know what number it was to be honest. No, I, I don't. I don't. The question mark. But when, but when when it was all unraveling at Toronto, right? Mm-hmm. So Callum Watkins had just signed, sort of big news, and it was all just sort of disintegrating into sort of dust around us. And I think in the last sort of grasp to rescue something, they were auctioning off a Callum Watkins match shirt. <laughs> the irony was that obviously Callum hadn't even trained yet, alone played for Toronto. <laughs> yeah. But, but that was did. to pay the wages, wasn't yeah. it? It did, yeah, it got nine seventy five from Janet from Dewsbury. <laughs> <laughs> Mine got fi- a fiver from Carol Wilkin from Hope. Yeah, Carol Wilkin, quite, quite a few. <laughs> um, but look, great to have you here, Callum. Honestly, what um, when we take you right back to early days yeah. in Stretford was was the big dream as a, as a kid. Take us take us back to the the childhood. Yeah, um, to be to be honest, we got into to rugby league. Me and my, my older brother. Through my dad. Uh, mm. My dad used to work in Trafford Park, so a lot of guys that he worked with were were from Salford mm. and were into rugby. But my dad had a little inkling of, of, of rugby in him. He uh, he played a little bit when he was a bit younger, so um, he did go to a lot of the Salford games in the past and wanted to take us um, uh, to it. And pretty much from there, um, going to watch Salford at the Willows and all that stuff, and then obviously playing on the weekend and around, around Salford, it basically just gave us an opportunity to to have the dream. Really. So it's gone it's gone full circle. It's taken a while to go full circle, isn't it? For you to come back to Salford to, to go to Salford in the first place. But to talk to us about the Willows, because I remember going there um sort of a teenage years, you know, late teenage years. It was that was some place for people who were listening who were too young to have to have been there. It was a it was a tasty little venue. Yeah, very, very tasty. Um they had the shed, uh, where all the home fans were were there, the you know, the pretty wild the Salford fans. So uh yeah. Was, let, that, was that to the right? So as you come out the tunnel, that yeah. was right. That, that was big right. tall one. Yeah, that's where you get yeah spat, the big tall you get one. Yeah, that through that. <laughs> you know, there's like a little cage, isn't there? Yeah. Like so it's the way you walk out, it, you know, you walk out onto the field. You, you're going through a cage basically, yeah. and then on the side, on the right hand side, there's Salford fans braying you. And you must, have, <laughs> you must have played there, John. Yeah, yeah, played yeah. there. Yeah, it was. It was actually. It was a tough place to go. That just because of that. The the the, the changing rooms, at the Willows were. were were infamous, you know, yeah. like uh, they're real slope ceiling. Yeah, and they yeah. had like off, you know, a bit like this. There's a Chesterfield in the corner. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple of lads getting changed on like a, you know, wing wing back armchair with no leather on it. It's mm. like it was all really random. But but all I think psychological, do you reckon? For not no, but it's no. just no. lack of fun. Just twisted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Usually, usually, fun. usually at away grounds, you get your shirt lined up and where it goes in the order of the positions and everything. But I remember at Salford, you had the smaller guys at one end just because they could fit under the ceiling. So you hook us in your Halfbacks in the coach, like Ian Watson. Yes, we will be down one end, and then taller fellas will be down the other, where it was a bit of a higher. Yeah, under seat. the terraces of the yeah, right. Yeah. You could right hear it. The you could so hear yeah. it. You could hear it outside. Yeah, outside. So you used to you used to stand on those terraces, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did as a kid. I was a ball boy too. So oh, yeah, yeah, I was in the thick of it really. Yeah, I went there. to I went to a lot of the away, the away games as well. So yeah, uh, during the times they they, they they were relegated a couple of times, I, I used to go watch them even even when they were down as well. Yeah. Is that, just go is that where you sort of fell in love with the professional game? Do you know you you were playing as a junior, but but that that sort of being around, being a ball boy, being amongst it. Yeah, is that where you fell in. Def- love? Definitely, because we, we, I, well, I met plenty of players in the past. Mm. Um, my favourite player was Jason Robinson at Wigan, so I managed to get his autograph when when we played at Salford one time. So that was a, that was a big memory for me, uh, remembering like 
you know, this this could be real for me if I can you know, put my mind to it. And yeah. um, during them times, I I knew that I was I had the potential to do it. So uh, how did you put, know that? What was what was the route then from from Salford watching on the terraces to being at Leeds as a kid? Um, it, it was pretty strange to be honest because um, my brother he was playing at Warrington. He was at the academy. Cash. Yeah, Cash. Yeah, yeah. he was at he was at the academy um, under eighteen. So I went and watched a game um, with uh, my dad. And they were playing against Leeds. And previous before that, we were doing like these uh, these camps, these national camps. Mm. And we play like for the Northwest or Lancashire, it was, and we play Yorkshire and then we play Cumbria. So there were scouts there, obviously. And then a few months later, I was watching my brother play. And they played against Leeds and um, Leeds beaten by like 40 or something like that. Mm. But then we, we, we had an opportunity to then uh, do like the water and stuff at Warrington. They just invited me to, to do it. Um, so I did that and helped out and basically I just walked out with, with my dad and obviously Cash as well and uh, there was a coach there called John Bastian who who I think is at OKR at the minute, uh, yeah. helping with recruitment and everything and he um, he basically said, look, we want to, we know we've watched you play before, we want to see uh, how you go if you want to if you want to come down and uh, look at the facilities and, and, and stuff like that. It just just went, it was like a whirlwind, whirlwind really, w w w which happens. But if I didn't go there, then who knows? I would have been, I might have been at some a different place. I might have been at Warrington or I might have, yeah. I don't know, Salford, I don't know. So yeah. yeah, I was pretty lucky in that aspect to see them, see them there at that time. It does hinge on moments, you know, that time in your early career where, you know, you could go one way or another, you could sign for one club or another and for whatever reason, you know, those little decisions that you make or, you know, like going to this, you know, going to the Warrington or whatever, you know, you know they, they lead to, there's big consequences off the back of it. And mm. I always remember, you know, I was, um, I played against Lee for whole KR and had a good game. Ian Millward was the coach of Lee and then sort of 12 months later, I signed for St. Helens. So you neglect, but when you look back, it's good to reflect in it. These little moments yeah. that have big consequences, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I def yeah. You know, if I, was, if I didn't go to that game just to watch my brother play, then it might have been a totally different story for me. Or you might have just been really talented and they picked you up anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? That good kid just, over there. <laughs> yeah. we'll you know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but even when I went to uh, the... Uh, they got me to visit the stadium basically, and it it was great. And I went to the training ground, and then I went to a game. Basically, Barry McDermott invited me and my dad to the to the game. Uh, I think it was like a last last game of the season. I think it was in two thousand six. So I got to meet the players on the field as well. To uh, shook Kev's hand and everything. And I was like, wow, this is it's something where I really want to be and and play. So. Did you think of then when you were meeting those guys, because it was such a phenomenal Leeds team even when you arrived then, 2006, 2007, you made your debut in eight, didn't you? Yeah. But did you, th did you, could you see a route into that team or did it just seem so far off at that stage? Yeah, it, it seemed far off definitely for me. I just thought, you know, I, my, my goal was just to get into the first team and uh, the year the year I signed for the academy, um, I was really no, I was on trial at first. I was on trial for the first couple of months and got um, got given a, a game against. I think it was against Warrington actually in, in in the academy and played pretty well. So it just went on from there basically. And then that full year, we, the academy, we went on to win the the 18s grand final. And and from there, we had, I had a really good preseason. After that, working with the the well the under under 21s at that time, mm. played the first three or four games that year. And played really well, and then they, they, they signed us up on full time. It was it was me, Paul McShane, uh, Ben Jones Bishop, um, Danny Allen as well. So we all we all pretty much got got put in there. From there. I remember you you played uh, a World Cup challenge really young, didn't you? You'd kind of only played a few first team games, and then yeah, was it, was it Manly at Ellen Road? Was that the game? Yeah. So so oh oh eight was the first time I played the first team, and I, I only played three games that year, and. Through, through injury, really, I got that opportunity against against Manly. Yeah. Um, we had a few injuries in um, in the centres and then in, on the wing as well. So that first time was like I, sh I shouldn't have even been there. You know what I mean? I was on the bench, so I, I wasn't even expected to get on. But then I remember uh, uh, Rob. He got he got he got knocked out by um, uh, Watmo Anthony Anthony Watmo. If you could remember that. Yeah. Um, and then they had to switch a couple of players around. So I ended up coming on just before half time. So I was like, I couldn't believe it. Like, you know, playing in a World Cup Challenge, I was, I was 17, you know, I was 17 at the time. So it was just a massive experience for me at that, that, at that time. Do you know, the interesting thing about, 
you know, what you're saying there, Cal, about, you know, when you got to Leeds, your goal was to get into the first team. You know, I think for, for, for young people or in any career, those incremental goals, you know, like you, you set a goal to get into the first team, then your next goal is to, to play regular in the first team and then it becomes right to just yeah. get a squad number and then you just, right, I want to play for England. But the, the importance of incremental sort of achievable goals, you know, when I see young players come in and they say, right, you know, that's it, I, you know, I want to play for my country or whatever. It's just, it's almost too lofty, isn't it? You know, those those incremental achievable goals, yeah, are just are massive. So, And it's funny, isn't it? A lot of careers follow that pattern. You, you're hungry just to replace a certain player who's in your position maybe you'll get into a team and then it just grows from there but I imagine the more you got into it your aspirations grew you know yeah yeah always always I've always had small little steps especially early on because obviously moving to Leeds then by myself I had to move after straight after school basically and basically my parents and everything so pretty much had to grow up pretty quickly from that on top of obviously trying to get into the first team so everything went really quick a lot quicker than I expected anyway you know after a full Full first year of academy, I was in the first team, and uh, it worked from there. But then I had so many, so many great players that uh, I played with and learned from straight away. You know, so that helped me, I think, achieve my goals even more. Sure. I think you said you were you were a hyper kid uh, when you were young. Did, yeah. How different did you feel to to the other guys trying to make it at that stage? I look, I just wanted to win all the time. It, it, you know, when I was at a, a team around Salford. Early on, we didn't win. We didn't. We hardly won any games, and I was the one that was crying. I was the one that was that cared that much about losing and everything. So, um, where does that come from, though? Do you think? Because you know, you talked about your brother. Is that is that, is that where? It's yeah, from? we're just competitive in in whatever we do. Really, I think for me, it's just about always about showing the right attitude and, and working hard. I think that's it gets you to to great places if you you put your mind to it, and you get a lot of players. You um, you know when you're doing like conditioning and running and pre-season and everything like that. Like, I'm the one that just thinks, right, this is what we need to do. We've got to just got to get on with it. You know, when things are bad, you just got to get on with it. That's how that's how I, uh, my mind mind works really. When things do get tough, I just think, look, there's better things that can come across. As long as I work hard, put my head down, things will come good. So there's a common theme there, isn't it, with 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 all the top athletes, especially in rugby, is is that competitive edge. I think. Like like Callum alluded to, it's it's knowing that in pre season it's really hard, or in games it gets really hard. But they're willing to to go through that because because winning is that important to them, and that's that's the common thing with every every professional athlete and especially rugby league player I've I've ever spoken to is they're just so competitive. They just want to win at everything because that's what it boils down to day to day is that effort to be the best day in day out. It's resilience that, isn't it, as well? Yeah. You build resilience through doing it. Like, you're never going to win all the time, but, you know, you, you try and then you keep trying and then you become a bit more resilient and then you keep trying. And it's actually, do you know, the biggest thing in, in sport is just following through with something. You know, there's there's a lot of, lot of people who try and fail, try and fail, and then go, right, that's me. But ultimately, if you're going to commit to a career in sport or a career in anything, it is inevitably a succession of failures you know, with with successes in between, and and the, the the people who hang around longest, and the reason you know Callum has been at the top of his game, and and look, there's been tough points in that, but the reason he's been at the top of his game and maintains that position at the top of his game is the resilience to overcome mm. that failure, because we all fail at some stage, some earlier, some later, some in the middle, but as a young sort of athlete, you have to get your head around failure quick, real quick. Otherwise, you'll end up in a fucking shit state because sport will kick you down yeah, the sport road. Sport doesn't care. Nah. It doesn't care if yeah. you're a nice guy or nah. you tried yeah. your best. Nah. Don't give a shit. Well, people don't care either, yeah, people really. Don't. Life you know, doesn't wide, care. You know, it's about you, personal responsibility. I'm willing to get hurt doing this, not physically, I'm talking mentally, physically, emotionally, all of it. Get hurt doing this because of failure. And then you've got to be resilient enough to get on. And go again. Did, did you feel accepted though? Because I remember Wilco's told this story loads of times when he left Hull KR, left the pigsty, and went over to St. Helens. Uh, <laughs> was there, a was a, there was a pig farmer. Oh, yeah. 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 He's not talking about that. He's not talking about during his 17th. I really mentioned it. He's himself. He goes, Hi, John Wilkin. I grew up in a pig farm in Hull. You can, yeah. My pig farming days in uh, Hull. You, you, you've told that story when you when you got to Saints. People essentially, I can't remember who it was, but said to you like, "Nah, mate, this isn't for you." 
you know. You want us to coach? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, That's but, not a good start, is it? Is yeah, the game way, signed me? He said, nah, mate, this is probably not going to work out. Yeah, no, no. Was that reverse psychology or did he genuinely believe that? No, I think he genuinely believed it. <laughs> yeah. no, I honestly think uh, he believed it, Will, and he really wanted me to leave. And I, I actually. <laughs> but you stuck, you stuck there. Yeah, no, no. I was like, you know, the shit that won't flush. Yeah. For, you know, when you're looking down and you're like, oh, yeah. yeah. this bastard's going nowhere. That's me. Yeah. I think that could define my career. That's Ireland. how Derek Beaumont described you, actually, the other week. I don't shit know. that won't flush. I did he? Well, he's coming really? on the podcast soon, though, Derek. Be good to have him on. Yeah. Well, we'll <laughs> tell him we're going Judge Rinder. <laughs> but no, Callum, did you feel, you know, because you, you go into that Leeds team and you're just around training, just around the place, just around the corridors, heading lead, around the training ground. You've got your your your, um, your Simfields and your Peacocks and your Burrows. Did, did they embrace you straight away? Did yeah. everyone take you on board? Yeah, away? yeah, definitely. Um, especially them guys, I think. For me, the 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 just, they're just great people. You know that that was the main thing for me. The 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 play the playing side, they they knew what they were doing. They're, they're so experienced. They they won everything in the game. So for me, I was just in awe of these players right from the start. I was just in awe of them, and I, I wanted to work as hard as I could to earn their respect. Really, um, and when I did get the opportunity, I tried to make it the the the, the most that I could. And yeah, we, we we got in positions where we did. I was in at a time where they were winning you know, pretty much every year. So the expectation on top of that was high. Um, but you so had to it, earn their respect, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It took it, yeah, it took time. That that took a lot of time and just playing and, and get, getting appearances on, on the board really and basically performing and being consistent was, was but, summit as well. But those guys would respect effort, wouldn't they? Through the week. Not yeah. you know a weekend, right, for sure. They would respect you for playing well. Mm. But it's a lot of the respect you gain through the week, Cal, isn't it? You know, how you apply yourself through the week. Yeah, it's it's all about uh, setting the right example, basically, and doing showing the right attitude towards them players and helping them out, basically. Because I, I used to help um, Keith Senior out a lot with his extras. And, you know, we would play against Matt Gidley uh, yeah. on, on a, uh, against St. Helens and stuff like that. I'll, I'll try and help him and try and do the skip out and just stuff, stuff like that to try and help them. Like, I wouldn't. Like just brush it, brush it aside and say no, you know. I mm. want to help my teammates, however young I was. Like if he wanted me to help, then I'd I'd, I'd always be keen to do that. So that's you an example. him a few really. times, Keith. No, no, <laughs> no. I got You've got to say that. You want to hear, right? I remember it was twice the size of me when I was when I first started. So, but I had to use, I I used to have to wrestle him. I used to have to wrestle him yeah. in the wrestle room. Yeah, I used to partner up the with him. The wrestle room. Tell us about the wrestle room. Well, it's just a big combat room, basically. It's in just Keith's, covered in mats. In Keith's cellar. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, it's like, um, it's a, obviously a room, but it's just covered in pads. Yeah. And pads and stuff like that. So you do like your little, um, you wrestle in. Has every club got a wrestle room? Well, most, yeah. yeah I'd yeah, say yeah, most yeah. have now. Yeah. yeah. Look at Will's face. I mean, <laughs> he's been, he's been working in rugby league. <laughs> he's been working in rugby league for five years. Well, you, get, you get two it's points like for WWE. It's not like The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin. It's right. like proper like Greco Roman wrestling. So it's just one on one. You know, what do you mean? Why, why is one on one important? He thinks it's like a belt on on. on, on <laughs> well, why are you interested in whether one on one's is, important? Is it like just Brian McDermott looking through like a sort of Call of Duty, a line of duty screen, a you know, one way screen, just watching this? Like, yeah, that's senior and. I don't Rockies. know why you've made this really sexual. It's I, don't nothing, know. I don't know why you've done that. One it's, not, it's just one on one <laughs> behind a, behind a no, double sided mirror. Naked wrestle room with oil. Pricked up. I've never heard of the wrestle room. It will get you in the wrestle room. <laughs> right. This still goes on, is it? Oh, yeah, <laughs> do you mean time. it still oh, goes on? Matter. It's actively part of training. Well, what yeah. do you get out of the. the I, I get it, in, as in like yeah. you know, taking it onto have a Have you pitch. watched a game of rugby league? Do you have, do, do you do you have six on six wrestles? What do you, have, you no, watched, six six. have you watched a game of rugby league? Yes. Will? I'm not saying, what do you mean? Yes. <laughs> what, what, go on, explain to me. What? Well, have you seen a tackle? Yeah. So when have you ever seen a six on six tackle? I know, but you're saying you just had a, so it's just a one on one. It's wrestle not like the Royal no, Rumble, no, Will. No, no, Will, it's, it's not, not like, like the Royal Rumble. He's thinking That's everyone comes doing entrance now. music. It's not always obviously one on one. If you're doing like wrestles type stuff, yeah. you might have a partner to work with, but then it might Part be then. In the it, normal game scenario, yeah. you might have to run into three players or two players. But this one's in a padded yeah. cell, basically. Yeah. But it's not six on six, ever. <laughs> it's never six on six. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, Just, there's, so. no, there's no steel chairs or anything like no. that. It's like proper wrestling. No. You learn so, so look, go on. Through, through your time at, at Leeds, you won everything, didn't you? Uh, pretty much everything pretty much. that was yeah. available. Which yeah. is, an, which is, I mean, you're smiling and we're glossing over that, but that is the stuff of dreams yeah, because huge. so many people just go through their whole career and get nowhere near that. Nowhere yeah. near it. So the boy that was stood on the terraces at the Willows very quickly had taken over the world. It won everything that there was. Was, was there, firstly, how was that? And then was there a side of when you'd com completed rugby league 
a sort of a feeling of emptiness because you'd, you'd, you'd done absolutely everything at quite a young age? I think, um, especially after the 2015 season, when uh, we, we had a real good year in terms of the trophies that we won, uh, obviously the people that were leaving as well that, that, that year with JP, Kevin, Kyler, they, they, they moved on that year. Mm. Um, I had a sense then that I thought this was, you know, we won quite a lot here. I was well. I was in the squad during them times like uh, 07, 08, 09, and all that stuff, but wasn't playing. So I had an impact in 09 in terms of playing through the season, but not in terms of the the, the back end of it all. So um, for me, it was just it was incredible. It was just an incredible ride, really, because mm. every year was different. Every year was a journey, you, and you do go through that. Uh, you know, adversity. You know, that's that's part of sport. That's part of life, really. But you go through it and then you, you reflect on it all. You, you self-reflect on it all at the end of the year and just think, wow, look you look where we were like mid-season. Because mm -hmm. I, I think most of the time when we did win, we'd start well, then we'd be really bad in in mid-season. And then it came to the end, we just, we just knew. bloody leads. They've yeah. Done that for, for <laughs> the and they've always, the always beat Saints in <laughs> the, the last, final. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so but it was it was like that for yeah. a majority of the time. I think the, the only time that was near, near enough consistent was was fifteen two thousand fifteen, where pretty much all year we was great. But after that, well, after the Challenge Cup, we we lost three on the trot. So we yeah. thought, oh, you know, maybe it's coming back to bite us here. Yeah. Yeah. But so yeah, what's, what's that down to Leeds? What is that? Because that 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 just that is a microcosm of Leeds over the last twenty years, isn't it? What's that? That inconsistency of being absolutely fantastic to. Oh, I, d I just think well, I, really I worked good. with with Brian McDermott in in Toronto, and it really opened my eyes to something that, you know, when you meet somebody and you speak with them, and then I started to understand why Leeds beat us in big games, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I think Brian, for, for whatever criticisms or compliments there are about his coaching, managed the emotional sort of the narrative of a season, the why, like why are we doing this, and, yeah. and could get hold of a story about why you were going to be great for a week or, you know, for a period, and and that's why I think at the big games at the back end that Brian's understanding of the emotional sort of development to get towards a big game I, it blew my mind because it was something we'd never done at Saints. We just got played, played, we maybe got to the grand final and we were like, right, we'll go play the grand final. There wasn't a really a why, you know, we, there was this, we had this really stubbornly held belief that we were just the best team or something, you know what I mean? And it was really naive, it yeah. was mega naive, you know, looking back. Did you not have that at Leeds, that feeling? We always had that, like John yeah. said, we always had that why, we always had that talk, especially uh, before the season. Brian would always have a plan ahead and we would always speak we'd always speak and have a plan ahead of what we wanted to achieve that year. Um, and it, it, it would change during the season as well, depending on how we were going. Mm. It were coming up to the big uh, big games at the back of the year, uh, back end of the year. There'll be something, something something will come up and we'll, we'll have a meeting or we'll talk about, this is what we're going to aim for. Why? Yeah. What? Why is this yeah. going to happen? How is it going to happen? You know, certain things like that. So. Yeah, he, he was great in terms of that. He was great in terms of motivating certain players at times as well. With you can never rest just on that, what Wilco was saying. You can never rest just on the the, the, the feeling that, oh, we're the best team. And we're no, it, win game. It, it, it's, um, it's like a, a, a mad sort of mentality, really. And, you know, I look back at those games where Leeds and, and Callum's team beat us in big games and, and look back at it with just a bit of, like, shame about how we prepared at yeah. times. Don't well, think we prepared thoroughly enough it wasn't it was like you know again like working with Brian McDermott I, I begin to understand like the the momentum and building of momentum and like building to something whereas I don't know if we ever really did that well there's something to be said for like looking at the bigger picture during a season because if there's if you play in every cup game and, and the playoffs it's 30 35 games in a season and to be mentally at your best every week, that's some toll that. I, I don't know many yeah. players that, that can be at the peak every week. So there's probably something to be said for kind of looking, breaking the season down and thinking, right, that's going to be a big period where we're going to be at our best and maybe putting extra motivation in prior to that so that lads are kind of hitting the straps at that point and then having to dial him back for a little bit and then kind of just working out when, when your team got to be the best. Because for the regular season... As long as you're in the top two, three, four, 
you don't probably need to beat your best every week, well, especially for a club like Leeds with the calibre of players. No, and that's where had. the yeah. playoffs have really, you know, it's been around for a long time now, but yeah. the playoffs really change like how things are done, right? Because yeah, definitely. you know, it's not like a race to the finish line. You can, you know, if you're best, you know, I think since we won the league leader shield like six or seven times in that period. But we came away with nothing, but you know no what I mean? Yeah. So the playoffs really changed that, as in yeah. managing momentum. Mm. You know, you didn't have to go full tilt for a full year. You can you can dampen it down. Whether whether you look sometimes on purpose. You know, when you're in that mid-season bit of a slump, it yeah. doesn't feel great, no. does it? You know no. what I mean? It's not always on purpose, but sometimes that can just give you the kick up the ass. What and you big need. clubs can do it. Like when when I was at Salford for a long time, we we would. We were struggling lower to mid table, and we had to give every single game our best because we knew there probably wasn't always going to be a playoff, so we probably wouldn't get a good club cup run. So there's probably six, seven games where we wouldn't have to be at that at our best, but every two points we had to just just fight for. But a team like Leeds with the squad they'd have, they'd have some squad rotation, would have players who could be six, seven out of ten, and they'd still be better than most players. Jamie Peacock could still be better than most front rows in the comp. So they could afford to be probably subpar and still get the results, but I think other clubs probably couldn't get away with that as well. Was the expectancy to to be at that ultimate level exhausting? Yeah, definitely. I think it made a big impact on the team. Like you said, you you won the league leaders so many times. I think during my time at Leeds, we only won it twice. So the the, the other times that we did win the grand final were coming from fifth. Or yeah, yeah. I think uh, the last the last time we were. At, um, in 2017, it was second. So, mm. um, and we was we we were consistent. That's how we finished second. We weren't great, but we were consistent. Plus, there was pressure off us from 2016 as well, which it didn't go too well. It took a lot of pressures from us, and you know, I think it was a big gear for Cass. And uh, we, we ended up we, we lost to them about f four or five times through the season, mm. pretty easy as well. So we went into that final thinking, you know, we're gonna have to come up with our best performance of the year to win that to win that game and you know we did was was Brian McDermott the coach would you say looking and you're only 30 now there's still a long way to go but in, in your career so far that the one coach that could really get inside your head yeah more than anyone yeah yeah definitely I think um at first I think we struggled in terms of communication I was like to me I'm pretty I'm pretty quiet at times but probably a lot more back then a lot more back then I was pretty quiet I just got on with my thing really and um didn't open up enough, so he was trying to get me to open up a little bit more. How and did he do that? I, um, basically, on, he, got, Callum, open he up. got me. To, <laughs> <laughs> he got me to see a sports psychologist, actually. Oh, did he? Yeah. So, um, well, it was a it was it was a woman that I uh, it was at college, and she was one of my tutors, but she was doing sports psychology as well. Mm. So she got me. Uh, he got me to speak to her for a little bit. So it was comfortable because she was my tutor. A couple of years back, so I was able to open up a little you bit. Trusted to her, her and you knew yeah, her, yeah, trusted her, yeah. So basically, I was just trying to get me to open up a lot more, and I, I was just more comfortable with with, with Brian. Really, he why, let me do my you, thing. Why were you closed off in the first place? I think that was just me as a person, anyway. Uh, during that time, so for me, I was just a lot of the time. I just wanted to work hard for my team. I wanted to win. Um, I just wanted. To, I, I guess a little bit was still about getting more gaining more respect really mm. just because of the players that I was playing with I was still at that time in awe of yeah. that, these that's players your, that's your character though uh, something that I noticed when Callum came into the dressing room at Salford last October was it uh, not August time yeah August um, time yeah. he was probably one of the best senses of the world senses in the world and had been for the previous 10 years and he was the quietest guy in the change rooms I know he was a new signing but um, to say all you'd done in the game I could see that it was natural for you to be quite a humble fella, pretty quiet, just got along with his job. And obviously we've had good chats and had a beer together and enjoyed each, other, each other's company. But I just think that's probably your, your character as well, isn't it? Yeah, I think that, I think that people thought it was strange when I got, got the captaincy at Leeds. But I think it was the help from Brian that helped me get to that point. I'd become a lot more of a leader then. And I'd say a lot more, a lot more things. But for me, I'd always say something which would be important for my team mm. and supportive to my team. I wouldn't just say something for the sake of it, you know. So that's that was my type of character. But I think a lot of people were shocked that I got the captaincy. I was shocked as well. I was shocked. I thought, you know, Steve Ward would, was, was the clear, obvious guy that would come in and do that because he just had that leadership quality about him, mm. how he played the game as well. He's, he, he was a captain, yeah, definitely. So for me, it was a, it, it, that, that when that happened... 
it was a big that was a massive thing for me it was it's probably one of my proudest moments really yeah, to, sure, to, yeah. to to be to become captain really without even expecting it you know it's interesting when you're in a squad like everybody's different and and you you know Callum walking into the Leeds dressing room you got Kevin Sinfield Jamie Peacock Rob Burrow, Danny Maguire you know all these types of characters like your the necessity for you to actually talk you know, like to actually be vocal as a younger, you know, player is probably not that. You know, you, that's yeah. not your role, is it? No. You've got enough guys who can roll out of Churchillian match day speech, you know, to get everybody going. Yeah. So you just don't need, you know, I, I feel like, you know, you don't need to do that. Mm. Yeah, that I felt that way and as that's well. that's quite a difficult thing because then, you know, when those guys move on and that, you need people to take that on. Yeah. And there's a skill in actually just developing your leaders underneath you. And I mm. think Brian McDermott, maybe developed you as that leader, but it can be really... I've, the reason I'm saying this is when I signed, again, signed for Saints, you walk in, there's like Kieran Cunningham, Sean Long, Paul Wellens, Paul Sculthorpe, and they do all the talking for the team. I, uh, I could turn up to train and not say anything. Mm. But when that changed, that's when I learned more about myself, where I had to talk. And that was and a I big... To... 2016 was a big moment for Leeds, for, because all those players, those leaders moved on. I know there was still Danny Maggs and Rob Burrow, Burrow but... JP and Sinny and Kylie were like the, the, the main guys, weren't they, in terms of li like driving standards, leading the club. And with you guys underneath, I think it's probably quite an important time f for the club to kind of move on to the next level. And it probably took a couple of years. Well, I, you had success in 17, but 16 and 18 were subpar seasons for Leeds, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, again, from the 17 season, obviously Danny and then Rob went as well. Yeah. So they were a, an integral part to that. That leadership group as well, but yeah, it was always it was always going to be difficult. It, the, the, the pretty irreplaceable, really, the, them players to for what they brought to the game and what they brought to the club as well. Uh, I remember JP. She, he, he reminds me every every single week where he he'd say something and he'd say something that he's going to do in the game, and he'll just go out and do it. You know, like that was a prime example of him. He would, he, he would talk the he would talk the talk and back it yeah, up. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then Kyler was quiet. He didn't really talk that much. Um, but how he, he he proved his way through actions and stuff like that. So when, when then, Brian McDermott then coaxed you out of your shell, did you improve as a player? Did you see that just as a natural transition to benefit you on the pitch as a player when when you were more willing to be able to talk and to be comfortable in front of people? Yeah, yeah. I think I think during that fifteen season, he tried to get me to talk a little bit more, you know, before games and stuff like that. Even just having a little chit chat with the outside backs and stuff like that, or our edge or or something like that. And, um, it did improve me as a player because I think that year was probably one of my best years. So, mm. um, and, is, and I think because we've had him on the podcast, haven't we, uh, Brian McDermott? It yeah. was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. But you know, he he's had his demons in the past. I'm sure he's <laughs> told you all about them. Yeah. And you know, he's got his demons now. He's still. He's still yeah. Yeah. We, we all have. Yeah. He's got. <laughs> yeah. He's still got. We his all demons. have. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. We've all got, we all <laughs> certainly have. But um, he, he he to me seems the perfect person to 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 change you as a as a man as a human because of what he's been through and because because you know he's he's made such a transition in his life yeah that you're comfortable then talking about those things in front of someone like that who's done it rather than you know someone you don't know anything about their history yeah i think what well, obviously what he's been through uh through his life it's been it's been very, very fairly tough so um f for him it was at the start it was getting him towards the players that what the best he wanted to get the best out of. I remember Brad Sing Singleton. He'd really get at him, um, you know, early on, just trying to f trying to fit him into the the the, the forwards and everything. Cause mm. He was playing most weeks. I remember he sent him out on loan as well. He went to Wakefield as well, and uh, he came back. He just came back a better player, uh, Brad. And I think it was through what Mac was saying to him. He was getting into him every single week. He'd have a good game, but there'll be always something. There'll be always something that Brian will get at to make sure that he's always on focus with it's his game. It's like a military approach, isn't a it? A bit, Something. yeah, yeah, a bit. He's got, he's, he's got ways that you know, players might not agree with, but... Um, you can't disagree with sending someone out on loan to get a response, though. Because mm. what, what's he doing there, right? So he sends a player... As a coach, right, you send a player out on loan. Why? To give him some negativity, to, to, yeah. to stimulate a response. Like, the good players go out on loan, come back... Paul McShane bounced around, you know, look what happens, you know what I mean? He's yeah. he's come great. You know, sending someone on loan is a test, you know. You get, you get the answer you need, don't you? It's if they come test. back a better player, he's worth keeping. If they you know, sulk, throw the toys out the pram, don't yeah. improve, then you realise that that kind of player is not good enough for that club. 
yeah, and that's I think that's just smart coaching. But it's uh, that was an it was just an interesting time for Leeds. You know that you know not good win it, not good win it. Take yeah, that that that, that routine. That's you know, that's why I think the seventeen season was. I think not a lot of people think it was really that great, but I look at it as one of the best wins really because of what we came through from sixteen and building more players and leaders through that, um, including myself. So. That, that year we went and won it, uh, no pressure was on us, yeah, um, from the year before, but we went on to win it and not expected to. And that was, the, it, we didn't even celebrate like like we did the 15 season, we were just jumping all over each other. Like the 17 season, we just stood there and we were just like, wow, you know, we've done we've done this. Like we, we've come from where we've, we've, we've come from, we nearly got relegated and then coming back to it and win it, I think. You know, it, show, it, it bodes well for, for for what Brian did for the club. If you look back at what Brian did for for the Leeds club, it was it, it was incredible, really. Yeah, it's resilience, isn't it, that we yeah. talk, we said before that bouncing back from adversity, which was 16, and it's probably the lessons that were taught and, and, and the culture that was set by those leaders that preceded that 17 season that kind of was ingrained in the squad, and that's what probably push you on to I'd say push you on to that success yeah, in 17 absolutely. And, and you were arguably you know one of the best centres in the world at this stage when you're lifting all of these trophies when you look back and you're in the nursing home and you're old and you're grey and we're all there rocking back and forward and we're Five past years. the jigsaw Wilkin <laughs> yeah this could easily be a scene this is a this is yeah. a almost Coming a, from a, a old seamless people's transition, old transition into the nursing yeah, home where yeah, we yeah. are now but what will you look back on with the fondest memories what's what's the one that was really special to you was it as obvious as to say a a World Club Challenge, or you know, what what, what is it that, that day that you remember? Like, wow, this is one that I'm going to remember forever. We've had a few days like that, but I think obviously the 15 and 17 seasons were a big moment. But also just just getting into the first team and playing my first game, I think mm -hmm. that was a big moment for for me, also my family as well. I always look back at that and thinking, you know, wow, I've got got an opportunity to to play in Super League. Like I've been dreaming as that. For since I was five years old to mm. do that, and that was my really around that time. That was my just my ultimate goal, just to play in Super League, and then build up from from there. So, um, yeah, plenty of memories. I couldn't couldn't put my finger on one really. But and look, it's not all been, been plain sailing, isn't it? It's not. It's not no. all been. You know, la, what's the word I'm looking for? Lolly, la 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 la. No, forgotten it. Uh, butterflies plain and rainbows. Sailing. <laughs> butterflies and what? Rainbows. rainbows. Is yeah, that the same? That. I yeah. love butterflies. Yeah. Is that the same? It's not, it's not all been butterflies and rainbows, is it? Nah. Um, look, leaving in 2019, how difficult was that? How awkward was that? Um, because, awkward? Well, just like, know, was it awkward? <laughs> Callum's well, left. In your mouth, was it awkward? <laughs> having, yeah. It was, the way that you left? Yeah, it was pretty strange, to be honest. Um, for me, I wasn't in a good place regardless during that time. So through, through 18, I did my ACL. And then trying to come back from that... Um, the rehab stuff was, was was all right, but I thought I could deal with it better because I'd done it previous. I did it ten years ago, previous, and as a young kid, you you, you just you just go through it. You just go through the rehab and all that stuff. And but when you're older, you you look back a little bit and think, oh, this is a this is a tough injury. You got to yeah. get back to. But you were only 26, 27. You weren't. And then 27, 28, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I came back and I came back too early. Definitely came back too early. I think I was like seven months into to the rehab really, and mm. should have just. Give it a little bit more time. There was the pressures of obviously being captain. There was pressures of I had a testimonial that year as well, and um, that's some pressure that. Isn't it? Yeah, I had everything like it involved. Obviously, getting getting back from injury, mm. sorting out all this testimonial stuff, and then then obviously being a captain as well. I have to lead there, and then obviously at home it wasn't going too great as well with my marriage. So on top of all that, it didn't. It it wasn't the ideal time to go back in and to play but I thought during that time I needed to play because I felt I was getting away from other things as well mm -hmm. which probably wasn't the best idea in terms of that it, it it didn't help my it didn't help my game anyway it what, didn't help our, what did my that feel players. like Callum you know you talk about all those things you know what did that feel like to you when you had all those things going on you know what I had uh, when I got back from Australia and obviously lockdown happened it's made me reflect a lot of it a, a lot of it really and it was tough. It was. It was. It's probably been the toughest two, two, three years of my life, yeah, really. Yeah. And reflecting back at it, you go, you go through certain things. And yeah. I have done through the years, like with my mental health and everything. But at that time, it was bad. Like it was, it was worse than it could ever be. So, for me, I think 
being able to come out the other side of that and accept being able to accept that that this stuff hap this stuff happens and got to be able to be resilient in certain moments and obviously with rugby it's been it's been tough like I didn't when when I did leave Leeds it wasn't the best time for me but in a way a better time for me to just get away from everything and then go to Australia the Gold Coast was it was incredible I loved it I absolutely loved it and it got cut short with Covid and everything and uh, my dad ended up getting Covid and the stuff was going on behind the scenes as well with, the, with my ex-partner and uh, her family as well, so it was best for us to come back and uh, settle back in in the UK because Australia wasn't it wasn't going to be forever. So um, the Gold Coast Gold Coast was a, a, a magnificent experience. It was something that uh, I'll never regret doing. I thought, Did like you think I, you'd be in the NRL longer? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to. I um, I I really enjoyed a real tough preseason. Uh, Justin Holbrook just came into to coach as well and. We, we, you know, we got on really well, and um, probably got the best out of me through through the preseason as well, getting ready for for a big year because it was obviously a big job for him as well, coming back to the NRL and wanted to to do well there, and you can see now how he's doing. So he's doing he's doing a fantastic job there with the, with with the players there. So yeah, I wanted to carry on. I wanted to carry on playing, and um, I think after that, uh, when COVID hit, I, I had another year left as well. So. Things were going pretty good, Rosie, and, and, and everything like that. No COVID or anything. I'd probably still be there now. So um, you just things happen, though, don't they? I think I think in you know listening to Callum there, there's, there's you know there's pressure in everything in life. You know, like most jobs have pressure, but I think there's there's periods in your life where there's pressure like domestically, pressure work wise. There's pressure, you know, with your mentality. There's pressure with you know external events, testimonials and all that. Yeah. And I think you can deal with a couple. Do you know that you can get away with a couple? Rugby's not going so great. Maybe, you know, something else isn't quite right. But when there's like maybe more than two or three sources of pressure come at you, it's it's a mad time. You know, and I and I remember we'd I think we'd played Leeds actually at Langtree Park and, and I was in a similar position. I was captain, team weren't going great. You know, there was loads of stuff going on at the time and I was just, you know, I, I sat down in the change rooms after a game and I think I just stayed in the change rooms for an hour after the game on my own, you know. Yeah. And it was that point at which I reckon there was four or five bits of pressure that I was feeling and dealing with. You know, you just keep them at arm's length, don't you? And then all of a sudden it just went full, boom on top yeah. of me and I was like, fucking hell. The, you know, the external pressure, criticism off fans, right, that's, look, it happens, doesn't it? You know, it still hurts though, doesn't it? Dom yeah, it does. But domestically, you know, things not going great. And then you've got, it, I found I was fine when it was one thing, but when it became three or four, that's when I, I because struggled. if it's one thing, you can turn in a different direction, and you've got your family, or if yeah. your family's not going great, you can go to rugby. But it's when everywhere you turn, there's that negativity and that stress, that that's where you don't get any respite. Yeah, and no. that's what I've I've found after speaking to. Yeah, obviously you and then other mates who've kind of had similar kind of. And I think the temptation is when when you're under that much pressure, and you know I see this part. I saw I saw it in you. Do you know what I mean? I could see it. Yeah. Do you know because I, I like I'd, I'd been there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I remember you know watching and and you know I felt for you not not as in sympathy. Fucking hell, you know what I mean? We're grown men. You yeah. know what I mean? But I saw it and I could I could understand it. And I think that that um. It's one of the things we neglect, you know, and when, when you're under that much pressure, do you know what you do? And, and I don't know if you did this, but when I was like that, I made it all about me. You know, I was like, it's my, you know, I put it all on myself. You know yeah. what I mean? You make it all about you. Yeah. And, and it's an interesting thing. It all becomes then internal about yourself when, look, the world just keeps spinning, doesn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Every day is like different. It's hard to see it like that, though, isn't it? It is, but it is, but it's the when only you, when way you're to, in the moment. It's the only way to see it because mm. the reality of it, any of us achieving anything that makes the history books mm. in a thousand years' time, are they going to remember, you know... I'd like well, to think they'll remember this podcast. Well, Can you imagine? You, they'll remember you. Yeah, this oh, could yeah. be like yeah, the start. Yeah. This could be the, the new New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> the newest <laughs> testament. <laughs> the brand new the testament. testament. <laughs> um, but look, you, you have had, for those who don't know, Callum, who are listening, you, you have had your struggles with depression as well. So yeah. we, you know, it's a good time to bring that into the conversation. When were you sort of officially diagnosed with depression? Uh, and I'm thinking back to the sort of 2015 season when everything was going so right on the field and things were going tits up off the field. 
And then yeah. you started to, like Wilco was saying there, I guess when it when it's coming from all angles and it becomes so overwhelming, you try and suppress it, you try and disguise it all, and that's probably the worst thing you can do, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think during that 15 season, uh, it, was it was around that time I did get diagnosed with it. Um, but it was probably, like I said, the one thing, that was just the one thing where I could then go to rugby and... Forget about it. Forget about it's it, basically. Medica medication. Yeah, 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 basically. Well, I, I, what I did was during, during the weeks we were playing, I'd go and see a counsellor on a Wednesday. Mm. And most of the time we play on a Friday. So after I did my counselling session, I was sweet. I was like, right, I've got a game on Friday. Like, I'm ready. Like, then I think I get, get the best out of myself when I'm playing. So but look, uh, that Can helped. I just rewind a little bit before that? So when was the point where you thought, or, or someone told you, or whether it was McDermott or whatever, or someone in your life went, you need to see someone. Or did you make that decision? And how, you know, because that's not that's not an easy thing to diagnose. No, I think it took me a long time. I think I knew I had something up for a couple of years before that, uh, and then it got to a point where my ex now she basically she didn't want to she didn't want to be with me anymore. Mm. So she she wanted to leave. But then um, I spoke to my mum quite a lot during that time because me and my mum had a, a pretty strange relationship growing up, mm. and. We wasn't as close as we wanted to be, but during that time where I was struggling, she 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 was there and and she helped me out massively. Basically, forced me to the, to the doctors basically and said, "Look, you need to do it. I've been through it before, and I've gone and got the help." So, yeah, from there we went on from there and uh, obviously spoke to the club about it and stuff like that. And they they were massively supportive of everything and uh, just helped me get them counselling sessions ahead. But I knew that. There's still some more underlining things that were going on uh, with, with me. So, uh, were, you, were you on antidepressants? Not at that time, but I, I am now at, at, at this moment in time. Yeah. So, yeah, and I've what, been what for a while. What are they like? Because I mean, well, I know what they're like. They're, it's like yeah. amphetamines, isn't it? But they it, that that is a Would rocky. You, how do you know? Well, I just know people who are on them. You know, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. like taking speed, you know, essentially, isn't it? It's kind of. A, but how do how do you balance yourself out when you have such incredible highs after? You know, the, I know the medication is supposed to keep it flat line. Yeah, it keeps it. It, it does. It, to be fair, it's, it's kept me flat line for, for, for quite a while. I do have a time where I do hit a low real real bad as well. Mm. But I think with me, it's, it was always about accepting it, accepting that there was a problem. And I think I had a, a, a real bad problem dealing with that. Mm. It took me such a long time to really, probably the end of, end of last year, early this year, has made me realise and accept the situation that obviously I'm in now. And is that the biggest barrier, the acceptance? Yeah, absolutely. Because there's loads of things that go on. Like, like I've seen sports psychologists before and they always talk about um, the situations that you've been through, but then you've got to be willing to get past that barrier of accepting it. And then you can then move on from it and then move on to the next part of your life. And that's always been the struggle for me, about accepting the fact that there's going to be time. This is this is an illness. This is something that you can manage. You can control. It's always going to be there. But if you can accept it uh, in yourself and think, look, this is what I've got. I know how to manage this, and I can move on with my life. And when it does does hit down, a down, I know how to to deal with it. So I'm a better person mm. to my kids and and all that stuff, and not being able to just be in a slump and. Um, Cause just let it well. Like, yeah, because yeah, yeah, that's what I was like. It's a slump. Yeah, draw the curtains. Yeah, and like, yeah. Like, everything go on. T tell it. Uh, go on. Share us with what those the, the dark, dark moments. Are, I just are like. uh, really, I just wasn't uh, proactive enough early on. I just didn't want to do anything. I just didn't have the energy when I was at home. I just didn't have the energy to do anything. You know, so I would look after my. Uh, well, at the time, my 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 my, my eldest son now, like I struggled to even take him out you know what I mean like I, I just had no energy to be proactive mm. at all and that made it difficult um, and even like going out to places I couldn't even like I struggled with like anxiety as well like I couldn't even pick up a phone to, to, to pay a bill or anything I was just that anxious about a reaction of someone or was that how anxiousness I was gonna... all the time or was that just during these periods I think during these periods yeah, yeah. a lot early on though a lot, a, lot, a lot of the time early on as well I just think with the rugby situation as well, I just thought I'm interested in complete all of these players and, I, you know, I don't want to let these guys down, you know. And, and there was the pressures of that, expecting to win, expecting to perform every week. And probably during them years, I wasn't I wasn't consistent, but at times I was really good. Like, 
And then it came to the 15 season where I was consistent. It's just so, so strange how life works, how you could be so yeah, yeah. consistent playing. But then off the field, you, you, you don't even want to get out of bed, you know? And uh, do, you think, do you think that rugby, do you think you had this condition all, all your life? Is it something that you thought was brought on by your rugby career? Or did, did, did your rugby career you know, influence your periods of sort of depression? Um, looking back, I think I think I did have it for for, for such a long time, yeah. for a very long time, probably through my teenage years, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I've got a real small group of friends, and um, and I've always had them small group of friends since high school. And for me, I've always been pretty quiet, pretty introverted with with what I do, and uh, like my own company most of the time. So yeah, and that's always been like that for me. But then I've also then obviously with rugby and stuff like that. Um, had the pressures of making it and trying to trying to be somebody really, um, but I always look back in terms of the rugby and think and think it's not it, that didn't really make an impact for me with my mental health until um, the nineteen season where I did leave Leeds like I wasn't playing well, came back from injury too uh, too early, and um, I was at I was at breaking point at that point. Because I'll I, I tell you, I'll tell you, I've not really said this before, but when um, we played, we played a game, we played a game at home, I think it was against Wakefield. I remember playing against Bill Tupo and I missed about seven tackles. I mean, he just ran over the top of me and everything. I had the worst game like ever, like probably one of my, my worst games, obviously defensively and everything. So I was gone, like my head was gone after it, like basically. And that weekend, like I planned my suicide. And I thought this would, you know, this is it for me. Like I, what I was going through from my marriage, like it was over. It was breaking. It was breaking down. I just felt there was nothing. There was nothing left for me really. Mm-hmm. So I got to that point where I was planning, uh, and it was going. It was going to be in my, in my own home as well. So, um, but for that. But looking back at that, my kids, my kids that weekend really got involved with me. So it then it made me realise like. I can't do that. Like I, I, I looked to myself and thought, I'm never going to be in that situation ever again, where I'm going to think about ending my life. Yeah. Them kids there, like they're not going to be with their dad if I do that. You know, like it's it's something that I've kept hold of for a while. I've not really spoke about it as much to people, but I feel like it's important to do that because I just want to help people. At the end of the day. I've, like I've done this thing on, on on Instagram, it's just to to give a give a helping hand to to certain people, and obviously I've done some stuff with Stevie Ward. Um, he's been doing a little bit. He did this resilience challenge a couple of weeks ago, which um, which was pretty cool, and just being able to see people and uh, check in with people and seeing how they're feeling, they give like a free word free word check in basically. And at, at that time when you were planning that, and you, like you said you planned it in your own home, in your head are you thinking? this is the most selfless thing I can do. Because obviously everyone else around you and your mum and your family and everyone and your brother, everyone would have had that happened. There would have been a time of looking back and gone, that's the most selfish thing that he could ever have done. But it, but in the scenario, you're thinking, this is the most selfless thing, that, that, uh, that I'm just not worthy of anything. Yeah, yeah, uh, y- y- you're totally right on that. And for me, I just didn't think I had anything left to offer. Everything that I was doing was wrong. Like that's how I felt in my in my mind. Everything I was doing was wrong. Yeah, ultimately, like I have to accept responsibility for certain things that I did in my life and, and in my marriage as well. So that that's part and parcel of it. That, that's that's me as a person anyway. I, I accept if I made a mistake or let people down. Like I'll always do that. But I was so hard on myself. That was that was probably the the, the issue. I was that hard on myself. So common that. And then on top of that, and then on top of that with rugby as well. I'm not playing well. I'm not playing. I'm captain. Like Jesus, I'm expected to to perform well. I'm expected to get the best out of players. When that's your release, yeah. As well, that's been your release, yeah. Right, and shit's going on, and then your release is not working now. Mm. So your medication. Right, I go to rugby because I just know that's my my way out. May escape, yeah. But then, if that's not quite clicking, man, that's that's. Do, do, you, ever, do you ever wonder what would happen? Sorry, do you ever wonder what would happen if had had you not? Do you still think that had you not had the rugby? Because at, the, at times, it's the pressure, it's the extra pressure that may have caused some of this, yeah, or, or heightened some of it. But without it, and you're Callum in Stretford, yeah, cleaning toilets. You yeah. know, he's got a civil engineering degree. 
No, I know. No, yeah. I'm, no, 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 I'm, so, well, I'm, no, I'm just saying I'm giving you a completely different life, which, yeah. which yeah. most people just have and are happy with and accept. But had you not had those highs of the rugby, would it have been harder? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But I, I always think like we're, without rugby, probably a bit of a lost soul, really. I don't know. It's hard to define give yourself you, away you from belonging. Yeah. It gave you rugby. purpose. It gave me a bit, yeah, yeah it definitely yeah. gave me a purpose. Yeah. It's made me to help me do other things as well, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. If, if rugby wasn't there, then it's just, I don't know. It's just a huge topic, this. Mm. Is that, 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 the reason I asked the question is whether you always felt like this or, you know, it, rugby can give you purpose, but it can break your spirit as well. Like it can, sport can do two things to you. It can yeah. build your ego up, right? It builds you up and you, you find purpose and you're proud of what you do. But the moment that stops going so well, it actually has a count. It can go the other way, you know what I mean? Yeah. You feel like you've let everyone down. Mm. Everyone's unhappy with you and stuff. So it, it, look, it's a huge, it's a huge topic, but like, it's unbelievable that Cal's like opened, opened up like that. And, and, you know, you'd be, astounded how many people feel like that you know yeah you know as soon as you probably said those words I, I, you know i imagine there's been a lot of people approached you said oh that you know i've been in that situation myself yeah yeah i'm gonna ask a really stupid question right and i know it's stupid but i'm asking from a point of someone who's never ever considered something like that how confident then are you when you know going forward and i know it's every day as it comes even now on medication and whatever with a condition like that yeah but that you'll never get to those sorts of lows again with the right people around you and the obviously the medication and, and everything going well, well away from from rugby. Yeah. To be, to be honest, it's, like I say, accepting that, that, that situation, but... Does it scare you that you could get back to feeling like that again? No, because I feel like there's been times where I could have gone that way. There has been times over the past few months as well that I could have gone that way. But I feel like I've, I know, like, I look at myself and think, look, I'm, I've promised myself, I've said to myself, I've committed to myself that I ain't going to get into that situation again. So whether it's, if I'm going to feel down, yeah, feel down, but being able to manage it, I know how to manage it a bit, a lot better, mm. better now, so. Do you know what's mad? That, you know, listening to Carol and that, um, a lot of that was down to his selflessness because he was, he was a hero of Leeds, he was captain of the club, he was coming back from a serious injury. And you probably knew at the time that you weren't fully fit, were you? But yeah. you wanted to play to help the cause, to help the club, to help your teammates. Quite a selfless act. But on the back of that, as a result, um, you're playing poorly and you're missing tackles against Bill Tupu, which kind of, it pushes you into, probably more into that cycle of, of depression and anxiety. And I think it's quite important for, for fans to understand that when a player like Callum might miss a few tackles, there are things going on behind the scenes and you, you, on the back of it, you might take measures or think about stuff that are as, as extreme as, you know, what you just said. So I think it's mad that, you know, a selfless sites can drive you to that sort of stuff. But I think it's also interesting for and, and key for fans or people watching on the telly to, to realise that you've got normal emotions like everybody else and keyboard warriors might not see what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah. It's, it's, it can be quite serious. Well, there is a lot going yeah, on in someone's head. Fans need heroes and villains, don't they? You know what I mean? And at yeah. one stage, maybe Callum is the ideal villain for him. You know what I mean? It's the, you, you, they can pin the blame on something or someone or, you know, and I've, you see it in sport, don't you? You know, somebody gets laden with loads of pressure and stress and blame and other people don't. And, and that's, look, being captain as well, like that, you know, the time, you know, it's part of the responsibility. You know, as, and as much as it's tough to deal with the cow, yeah. it, it comes with that. It comes with you, you know, you trade, put that. You, yeah. you, you, your captain. You that is on you. You know that you get put in front of the cameras. Like how many times I'm interested at this because there's times when Saints was not we're not doing so great. I mean, we you know we we're still finishing third, fourth, fifth, you know, in the league, but it's not going great. And you get shoved in front of the cameras at the end of the game, and the amount of times, your man, you, oh, know, you, you, just, you usually love that, don't you? Getting put well, in yeah. Camera. Until Damien Johnson from the BBC asked me, he said, "You've just broke a record today, John. Saints have never been beaten by as much in a Challenge Cup semi-final." Castleford, <laughs> was that Castleford? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember that. But it's tough, that, isn't it? Yeah. Because what do you do? Like, how do you deal with that? You know what I mean? You're in front of a camera. You don't want to be there. Yeah. You, you don't even know what to say, do you? No. For me, I just wing it. I just, <laughs> just, <laughs> just wing it and uh, try and explain as best as possible for, for them to know. But it's just hard to do that anyway. You just, you're in that kind of emotion as well. You're just like, 
this is not what you need right no. now after just what's just what's just happened. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just to re, I, I can't get over what you said there. It's, it's quite stunning what you said, but um, I, I find it amazing that you, sh- you should almost count yourself lucky that you had your kids because they stopped you doing. Yeah, what, what Do you reckon you, it would have might have done? ended differently if you didn't see your kids that weekend? Possibly. Possibly. But during that time, I was still living for my my ex and the kids anyway so it did right, help yeah. in that sense that I was still home you know but if I was on my own then but you didn't discuss knows, any you know? of this with with anyone at the time no how long did it take you to, to tell someone about that um, probably another year or so did it so after. you had that you kept that for a year yeah Fucking pretty much easy but when you're in that I imagine if you've been depressed and you ha- hit it you've been an actor for a lot of time you know what I mean yeah yeah and you, so you've been like, you, like anybody where you read about depression and, and people become unbelievable actors like as in you know you can put a, you can strut down the street you're fine yeah but you, you could see so that easily sit under your disguise wouldn't it that yeah. sort of stuff absolutely I, I probably during the time obviously with rugby and everything it was just so easy to to hide that and uh, I remember in 16, uh, 2016, I remember speaking. Oh, it might have been 17, actually. I was speaking about the depression that I had in 15. I never mentioned it to all the players. And the players, uh, some of the players would come up to me and say, like, I never yeah, I never even know. thought you'd yeah, be yeah. in that in that yeah, position, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. Never what, was, really ex- what was it like, though, the, the next day, the conversations that you had with yourself going into whatever after that game, rehab or whatever, or training three days later, four days later? The conversations that you had with yourself in the car on the way there, and I mean, I was still, did you I, just fully just click back? I into was still, in, I was still in a bad way then. Like, right during that week, I remember because after that game, I I took two weeks off. Like, I said, look, I can't. I need, to, I really, I need to get my knee right. I need to give it a couple of weeks. I went to get an injection in my knee, and um, during that week, they were get obviously getting me to train and stuff like that, and I couldn't train properly. I couldn't. I was doing a swim. Um, with one of the assistants, and I couldn't even, I couldn't even, I did the first, first like rep, I couldn't do any, I couldn't do any more, I just had no energy at all. I just, th- then I just went, right, I need to speak to someone, I need to get the help right now, like, I need to see someone. And look, the leads were fantastic with me in terms of that, they helped me out massively. Mm. But on top of that, it was a situation as well, I'm not playing well. I just signed a new deal the year before, which was, I was going to be marquee player, so they didn't want to go go ahead with that deal, plainly because I wasn't playing well. I wasn't in a good position, so that's what really happened through the lead situation, which ultimately through that year was really my last year anyway, and I wanted to play in the NRL. That was the plan, regardless anyway, because I signed a new deal and it would have been for another two years. But then after that, I'd have gone to the NRL. That was the, that was my goal anyway. I was going to go to the NRL regardless. So. Yeah. Just went a little bit earlier. Yeah, and just a little bit earlier. Yeah, just yeah. a bit earlier. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. it's, it's like, man, I'm, yeah, I think it's huge. The Will, you just said it then. It's, it's massive, really, to speak about in that such, like, it's not just that you're saying these things. It's it's the 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 honesty and, and the, you know, how you're saying it is, is powerful. People will resonate with that. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? People quite, listen yeah. to that. I, I hear people talk about these issues a lot and it doesn't, I can't, get my head around it I can't see it yeah. but with you I could I could see it yeah. do you know what I mean and, yeah. that, and that's why I find it powerful because you know I think um, we can all sit and say oh you know this is how you should deal with things and you know it's really tough and you know this blah 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 but it, it, it's it's the visual cues you know looking back and I saw I could see it in you you know yeah. what I mean and uh, the way that you've managed to ride it through and you're in a good place now you know that's yeah. that's the story isn't it mm-hmm. you know it's not it's not that that you know, you call it bad times. It's the fact that he's he's rode it he's rode it out and he's well. And there's you know, a long way of the journey to go. Now you're thirty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. he's, at the he's been around a long time. He? He's not thirty. There. There's not a chance <laughs> he's thirty. He's got Obafemi Obe- 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 <laughs> Martin's passport. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think also it's a really strong message. And you mentioned keyboard warriors, and there are so many of them out there. And it's I guess it's for some people it's quite easy to be a keyboard warrior. Maybe because they're so unhappy with their own life Cowards. themselves, which you know is fitting what we've just been talking about. But I think it's a message that before you pick up your phone and think, you know, 
I'm going to write this, I'm going to write that to Callum Watkins, who's not been playing the way that he should have been playing, or whoever, or George Burgess, or all these superstars that sh- should be playing the way that they were playing five, six years ago. Yeah. Maybe just think, do you know what? I'm not going to be a CUNT today. I'm not going to send that message. Yeah, yeah. Sure, but then what Callum's done, which is fucking genius, is he's used personal responsibility to get himself help. Yeah. You've got yourself help. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, these people, if you play a sport, people are going to come at you. You know, sitting here on two Chesterfields. Yeah, but what I'm saying, saying is, it's, it could be one message that could have tipped you over the edge that weekend. For sure, for sure. But Callum, you'd acknowledge there's a problem and you've dealt with it. And yeah. That's, that's... yeah, both good answers. <laughs> <laughs> No, you're right. It's it's. It, I, I look abuse online. Abuse is just is is like it's just part of like this. The it social, compounds the issue, doesn't it? It can like, compound. Yeah, people are, are compelled to tell everybody what they think of them. Like, you know, it, that's just the way the world is now. Mm. You've seen it. You know, whether it be, you know, everyone's opinion on Meghan and Harry, Derek Beaumont on me. You know, there's just there's just people out what's there. His, what's Derek's opinion on you? <laughs> yeah, I don't know this. No, <laughs> just give it a Google. He obviously Callum Google, yeah, He's yeah, been reading right. up on it. <laughs> Listen, Not mate, I really right. appreciate you coming in. And uh, I mean, I don't think any of us were expecting that, but I mean, it's it's so good to see you one in yeah, a really good place now. Um, and you know, and it's, you're not always going to be in a good place. You know that. So yeah. the fact that you can manage that and control that is amazing, because that's the biggest gift that you've got, being able to to manage that going forward. Because it's not just going to disappear. So, um, so I appreciate your honesty, mate. It's really good, oh, and hopefully that will help yeah, a lot. No, of I appreciate people it, guys. I've enjoyed it. Really as well. Thanks it, so yeah, much, yeah. mate, for coming in. Uh, don't forget, you can download uh, all of the episodes going back to series one. I don't even know what series this is. What is it, John? I don't know, it's too many. <laughs> too many probably probably not going to get funded again. <laughs> so um, You can give us a little follow at Out of Your RL on Twitter. Get your um, podcast from wherever you can download them from. And we will see you, you little buggers, next week.